Yes, I would campaign for the Nazis and vote for Adolf Hitler. These words shocked me as they came out of my friend's mouth. What shocked me more is that this young man is a conservative homeschool Christian. Why would such an intelligent individual not only admit he would vote for Hitler, but say it with pride? I believe the problem goes deeper than just misguided logic, and in fact strikes the heart of why conservatives lost the recent presidential election. Today, I will expose the devastating implications of a mentality that has become pervasive within conservative Christian circles. The view that one must vote for the lesser of two evils. I will attempt to persuade you today to choose a righteous path in every situation. Using the 2008 presidential election as a case study, we'll learn about the lesser of two evils philosophy. After that, we'll analyze and weigh its justifications. And finally, we'll learn what our moral responsibilities are and set a plan of action. During the recent presidential election, Barack Obama's views on abortion were well known. His support of extremist pro-abortion groups, his pledge to sign the Freedom of Choice Act, and even his support of infanticide were no secret. John McCain's views, however, demonstrate an apparent disconnect between his campaign rhetoric and his record as a U.S. Senator. Eight years after they released a report naming McCain's candidacy as a threat to the pro-life movement, National Right to Life reversed its position when it became clear that McCain was the 2008 Republican frontrunner and gave him a 100% pro-life rating. Now, if we only listen to National Right to Life's rating and McCain's campaign rhetoric, we might be led to believe that he was pro-life. However, as we examine his record in more detail, we see that he was not. In 2005, he voted to provide nearly a third of a billion dollars to fund abortion in the cases of rape and incest, authorizing taxpayer funding for more than 300,000 abortions. Through 2008, he continued his support for expanding embryonic stem cell research, the fatal experimentation and dissection of the tiniest boys and girls. At the Saddleback Forum with Pastor Rick Warren, McCain claimed to believe that life begins at conception. Yet, this is irreconcilable with his 30-year record of advocating and funding the wrongful killing of the innocent. It is clear that McCain was willing to lie in order to win our votes, and we were all too ready to believe him. Some of us did not know McCain's pro-abortion record and voted for him in ignorance. But those of us who did justified our support for his candidacy by pointing to him as the lesser of two evils. We made political calculations and concluded that we had to support the pro-choice Republican in order to defeat the more radically pro-choice Democrat. But when did we forget that there are some issues, such as abortion, that are non-negotiable? When a person supports mass murder, that person is automatically disqualified as a candidate that Christians can vote for with a clear conscience. Let me put it this way. Even if our candidate had won, we so where then does this lesser of two evils mentality come from? It certainly does not come from our Constitution. When citizens are obliged to support one candidate who doesn't represent them, in order to stop another candidate that doesn't represent them, they end up with a government that does not represent them. <laughs> President John Quincy Adams enjoins us to always vote for principle, though you may vote alone, and you may cherish the sweetest reflection that your vote is never lost. Voting for the lesser of two evils effectively destroys the idea of a constitutional representative republic as envisioned by our founding fathers. Similarly, nowhere in the Bible does Christ say, do the lesser evil so that you might achieve good for my kingdom. In fact, the Apostle Paul warns us not to do a little evil in order to potentially achieve some future good when he says, why not say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is deserved. <coughs> Scripture is clear that moral considerations take precedence over political expedience. In truth, the choice to vote for the lesser of two evils is primarily made out of fear. Fear of the devil with his mask off chases us into the arms of the devil with his mask on. But that fear is a bottomless of a conservative in Nazi Germany applying the lesser of two evils standard in the 1930s could say that 
in my district, the Marxists are ahead of every other political party in the polls. And even though the Nazis want to kill the Jews, I fear that the Nazi the Marxists may end up killing more people than the Nazis. Therefore, I will campaign for the Nazi party and cast my vote for Adolf Hitler. History would eventually prove that assessment correct, as the Nazis only murdered six million, while the communists in Russia alone murdered more than 20. Of course, we know that the German in our example could never be justified in support of Hitler. But by the standard of fear, it's easy to see how even Christians like my friend would say that in that circumstance, they would. When we no longer fear God and instead fear wicked men, what candidate wouldn't be so, provided the alternative is worse? When our justification for supporting one evil is fear of a greater evil, then there is no depth of depravity and atrocity we would not support as long as there is a darker alternative. Voting for the lesser of two evils abandons the immovable standard of righteousness and replaces it instead with a shifting standard of moral relativity and situational ethics. Christ's standard requires that we fear no one but God. Matthew 10, 28 exhorts us to fear not them which can kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Is it truly such a terrifying thought to consider what our country would be like if one million Christians chose to reject the lesser of evil's philosophy and instead chose to honor God by refusing to do evil that good might come of it? We aren't called to make political calculations as to which candidate will murder fewer innocents. We're called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So how are we going to seek? We know that any person who advocates and defends the wrongful killing of innocents is a conspirator and accomplice to murder. And from his record, we can see that John McCain was just such a man. We also know that Christians should not support mass murderers, even if we are afraid of other mass murderers. Instead, our standard of behavior should be based on trust in God. Therefore, it is every Christian's moral responsibility to only use the authority he has been given in the bounds of righteousness and to act in accordance with God's will. Critics argue that voting on principle is impractical, but Christians ought to act on the wisdom of God, even if it appears foolish from a merely human vantage point. Nevertheless, I believe that acting on the wisdom of God is the only path to real success, even in human terms. Christ does say that if we faithfully seek his kingdom, all other things will be added unto us. There are two primary benefits for voting based on principle rather than on political expedience. The first and most obvious is that when a citizen votes for a godly, though imperfect, candidate, the citizen honors God by voting morally. Second, each vote for such a candidate adds to the likelihood that that candidate will win the election, reaping pragmatic benefits. The only reason godly candidates lose is because too few voted for them. When we create imaginary requirements to only vote for one of the two major party candidates, we submit ourselves to a system that advocates moral relativity and presses us into making excuses for unrepentantly wicked men. It's the devil's game to give you two evil choices and then act like he's the good guy by letting you choose one. When given choices A and B by the devil, what would Jesus do? The answer is C. When Christ was asked by his disciples, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, neither. Given two wrong choices, he of course refuses to vote. We are to follow Christ's example by choosing the good that God has provided to us in every choice and circumstance. When we vote, we should look for the candidate that most effectively stands for his will. And when we find that candidate, we should vote for we're right in the name. We're never forced to choose between two evils, and never have been. Jesus knew this and lived it. Christ came into this world so that we would always have a right choice. With him, we can stand in the face of even seemingly insurmountable odds and overcome evil with good, for all things are possible 